Pos. What's perfect? Um, I'm very excited to be joining the meeting today and um, I've really enjoyed the morning's talk so far. Um, so this is an amazing time to be working in computational biology. In the past decade, we've seen this massive um, advances in technologies, which mean that we're now able to generate and share wealths of genetic data, and also to use this data to explore the origins of our genetic diversity as modern humans, and the, the impacts of that genetic diversity on our health. And one field that's emerged, and are you still seeing my screen? Something just happened. Yeah, I I see the slide with the elephants. Okay, and that's strange. Uh, the okay, better. So um, let me go. So one one field that emerged during this past decade is the field of ancient genomics, and this is the study of DNA from extinct organisms. And it was just about a year or so after I started my group at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig that we began to discuss whether it might be feasible to think about sequencing the nuclear genomes of extinct archaic humans, like Neanderthals. And at that time, this was really a bit of a wild dream. I remember sitting around the table and talking about it, and it wasn't at all clear that it would be successful. So there was a sort of, you know, let's give it a try, but, you know, probably this won't work. Um, and so today, what I want to share with you is the progress we've made over these 10, 15 years, how we've been able to do that, and how it's been possible to use the genomes of these archaic humans together with the genomes of modern humans that are, are, have accumulated really fast in the last years to understand our history and, and to understand the genetic basis of particularly interesting modern human traits. And the focus of much of the work that I will present today um, are the Neanderthals. And I'll just tell you a little bit about the Neanderthals so that you know who I'm talking about. The Neanderthals are a group of archaic humans, and we know from the fossil record that they lived in Europe and Western Asia from around 400,000 years ago until around 40,000 years ago. In contrast, we modern humans, we appear as a group in Africa approximately 200,000 years ago, and then we expand out to, um, to inhabit the whole globe. And that expansion from Africa into Eurasia and beyond happened at somewhere between 70 and 100,000 years ago. And so what we know then is that modern humans and Neanderthals were living at least for a small amount of time, perhaps five to 10,000 years in Eurasia at the same time. And we know that the Neanderthals disappear at a time that coincides with the expansion and with the growth of modern humans in Eurasia. Prior to the availability of genetic data, it was a topic of quite some debate whether these two groups might have met, might have interacted and might have interbred. We also know from the skeletal remains of the Neanderthals that there were morphological differences, that they have skeletal differences um, to modern humans. And we, we assume based on their geographic distribution and differences in the tools and the art that they left behind, that there were likely also cognitive and behavioral differences. But the very first Neanderthal DNA that was sequenced was sequenced in the late 1990s. And it was really just a few hundred base pairs of the mitochondrial genome. And, and early work in ancient DNA really focused on the mitochondrial genome because the mitochondria, the mitochondria are copied, present in multiple copies per cell, and therefore you have multiple copies of the mitochondrial genome and therefore a better chance to, to um, be able to amplify mitochondrial DNA. And this initial work was done with uh, PCR, with the polymerase chain reaction. And from this um, small amount of sequence from the mitochondria and from the subsequent sequencing of multiple additional Neanderthals, which you see here, it was clear that the Neanderthals most likely were completely replaced by modern humans as they spread out, that there probably wasn't any or at least not much interbreeding because we don't see any similarities between the mitochondria. But we also know that the mitochondrial DNA is just a single locus. It's inherited only from mother to offspring. And therefore, we couldn't rule out based on that alone that there might have been some interbreeding between modern humans and Neanderthals that would have been detectable only if we could have autosomal genome sequences. However, in the late 1990s, large scale nuclear genome sequencing of ancient specimens was simply not feasible. And this was due to a number of features of ancient DNA, DNA that's extracted from ancient specimens, together with also the limited throughput of the sequencing technologies available at the time. 
So just to run through some of the, the features of ancient DNA, the first is that, as you see in the top left, ancient DNA is typically highly fragmented. The bones or teeth lie in the soil for quite some time and the DNA fragments into smaller and smaller pieces. And the length of those fragments is dependent on the age and on the preservation conditions. But we're talking about molecules that are on average in the range of 40 to 50 nucleotides long, um, which poses a number of challenges both for um, extraction, but also for computational analysis. Second, the DNA is chemically modified. Um, what you see here is the kind of chemical modification we see with time, um, deamination of cytosines to uracil happens. Um, and those uracils are read by the current sequencing technologies as thymine, as T. Um, and this poses challenges for alignment because we have um, mismatches between our ancient sequences and a, say a reference genome like a modern human, which are all C to Ts. However, the signal is a very important signal. It's an important signal because molecules that really carry this in enhanced rate of deamination are most likely or more likely to be truly ancient molecules. So they're important molecules to get aligned to the reference genomes. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, the vast majority of the DNA that we get from most specimens when we extract DNA is microbial. And as you can imagine, if 80 or 90% of the DNA that one gets from a specimen is microbial, this not only makes sequencing really expensive because 90% of the molecules you get, you have to throw away. Um, it also means that we need methods that reliably distinguish ancient human DNA that's short from microbial DNA. And so it was really only in around 2005 with the advent of next generation sequencing technologies that it became possible to directly sequence ancient molecules in the quantities that were needed to reconstruct nuclear genomes from ancient humans. And you see here in this flow diagram how we do this, we get a bone and we extract from that bone bone powder. We then extract DNA and prepare libraries. We index them with two barcodes so that we can make sure that we uh, are only looking at molecules that came from our original specimen. And then we either sequence them directly or we could put them through some kind of hybridization capture and sequence them. And for those that perhaps are familiar with genome sequencing, this might look pretty standard. But I can tell you that at every step of this process, my colleague Matthias Meyer and his group have customized the molecular techniques that are needed to optimize the extraction of truly ancient molecules from these specimens. And then following on from that, once the sequencing is done, my group has developed and applied computational tools that we can use to accurately identify and then use an analysis the molecules that, that Matthias's group manages to retrieve from these specimens. The idea being to reconstruct the best possible quality ancient genomes. And so over the last 10 years or so, we've used these approaches to sequence to high coverage the genomes of three Neanderthals. These are a Neanderthal, a Neanderthal from Vindia Cave in Croatia and two Neanderthals from different caves quite near to one another in the Altai Mountains, which is um, in Russia. And these three genomes have been sequenced to between 30 and 50 fold coverage in short reads. And so for the non-repetitive parts of the genome that are mappable with short reads, these genome sequences are of a quality similar to modern genomes. And we can do things with them like we can do with modern genomes. We can, we can run genotyping and we can do all sorts of analyses of haplotype lengths and similar things. However, most specimens are not amenable to that kind of really high coverage sequencing. Uh, most specimens are pretty bad. And what we've been able to do then with these is to sequence to more modest coverage, the nuclear genomes of additional Neanderthals, approximately 10 at this point, but we have a project at the moment to try and sequence up to 100 uh, Neanderthal genomes. And this has allowed us to represent the geographic and also the temporal range of the Neanderthals across Europe and Western Asia. In addition, during um, the, we sort of survey sites and try and do sequencing. And during that, the sequencing led to the discovery of a new archaic human group. In 2010, we received this tiny finger bone that you see sort of perched on top of one of our lab people's hands in the top left. Um, a small finger bone found in Denisova Cave in the Altai Mountains, which was sent to us and we expected that it would either be a modern human or a Neanderthal. But when we sequenced the genome from this individual, we showed that it belonged to a previously unknown archaic group, a group that was related to Denisovans, 
I'm sorry, related to Neanderthals, but she, and shared a common ancestor with them something like 300 to 400,000 years ago, and more distantly related to modern humans. This group has been called the Denisovans. This is after the cave site where they were found. Initially, we had just the one finger bone, but subsequently we have sequenced um, more limited amounts of nuclear and mitochondrial DNA from a handful of specimens, all currently from this cave, uh, three teeth and, and, and another bone, um, showing that Denisovans lived for uh, an extended period of time in this region, in Denisova. And very excitingly, uh, earlier this year, a, a jaw bone was discovered uh, on the Tibetan plateau in China. And based on uh, the morphology of the teeth that are there, as well as on some proteomic data, this has been um, assumed to also be a Denisovan, making it the first, if, if it's the case, making it the first Denisovan outside of Denisova cave to be discovered and suggesting that Denisovans were, were inhabiting um, rather high altitude environments like the Tibetan plateau. So with these genomes in hand, we can ask a number of questions and I'm really going to just run through a whole bunch of those today um, and touch only lightly on them because there are just so many applications for, for these ancient genomes. One of the things we analyzed first is the gen looking at the genetic similarities and differences between these archaic Neanderthals and Denisovans and we as modern humans. And this is because we're particularly interested in identifying genetic changes that have taken place on the human lineage since our divergence from a com our common ancestors. And we're interested in that because these changes that take place that are specific to modern humans they um, may underlie some of the particular traits that are interesting about we as modern humans, our cognitive abilities and perhaps our language abilities, among others. In the past, this had been done by comparing human genomes to our nearest living relatives, the, the chimpanzees. But there's something like five to seven million years since our divergence from a common ancestor with the chimpanzee. And that means we have a lot of changes to look at. And it's very hard to pick out the ones that are interesting and, and relevant. Therefore, Adding in um, the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, with whom we share a common ancestor 600 to 700,000 years ago, much narrows this portion of the, of the lineage that we have to look at. It narrows it down to um, approximately 30,000 changes, human, modern human specific changes that happened on this lineage since the split from Neanderthals and Denisovans. And about 100 of those, which is rather a small number, are fixed um, amino acid differences, protein coding changes. And this, this set of protein coding changes are currently being explored in Svante Pebo's lab um, in cell models, in organoid models, and also in animal models to try and under understand what's the impact of these non-synonymous um, mutations or non-synonymous differences on different phenotypes. In my group, we've maintained for some time now what we call a modern human catalog. As we've accumulated Neanderthal and Denisovan genome sequences, a number of people in my group, including the people who you see in the top right here, Martin Kircher, then later Fernando Rassimo, and most recently, creating and annotating and maintaining this complete catalog of um, recent changes in modern, in modern humans that are developed out of the alignments of Neanderthal, Denisovan, and modern human genomes. And in the most recent update, Christian Haider has extended this to include um, all the high coverage Neanderthals and the Denisovans, as well as extensive human variation data, which is accumulating. Um, and he's put this all into a resource, which we call the Modern Human Catalog Browser. It's still in its beta phase. But this allows, it's based on the exact, the exact browser, which people who are familiar with, with modern human um, genetic variation resources might know. This allows people now to explore differences between archaic and modern humans um, and provides the variation data for variation that we know about in modern human populations. And what you can do is you can look at things like for sites where modern, there are modern human differences, you can look and see, you know, what is the state in each of the Neanderthals. So here we can see the Neanderthals are all homozygous for the ancestral allele. We know that all modern humans, as you can see here, do not carry the ancestral allele. They all carry a derived allele in this gene called ADSL. And this is one of the genes um, that's being explored in mouse models. Perhaps one of the most surprising insights into population history that came from the analysis of these first Neanderthal genomes was that there had been interbreeding between Neanderthals and the ancestors of modern humans. The initial evidence for this came from um, a rather simple statistic, 
um, which looked at allele sharing. And it was developed by Nick Patterson, who you see here, who's a, a colleague of David Reich's. And this, this is a very simple test that he developed. He calls it the Abba Baba test or the D statistic. And this test takes two sister populations, in this case, two individuals from two different modern human groups. And a third potentially admixing population, in this case, the Neanderthal, and an outgroup, in this case, the chimpanzee. And the, the, the idea behind this test is that if, if there was no interbreeding between modern humans and Neanderthals, then all modern humans, whether they live in Africa or in Eurasia, should be equally closely related to Neanderthals. However, if um, there is a group of modern humans who met the Neanderthals and interbred with them, perhaps people who had the chance to interbreed with them outside of Africa, they might share more alleles with the Neanderthals than individuals inside Africa. And so this test is very simple. It simply counts the, the, the frequency of these two patterns, ABBA, where population two shares an allele with the Neanderthal, and BABA, where population one shares an allele with the Neanderthal. In a case of no mixture, we expect that those two statistics should be equal. We should see the same number of sites in um, each pattern. However, what we saw when this was done was that there is an excess of BABA sites, an excess of sites where non-African humans share the Neanderthal allele compared to African people. This suggested that there had been mixing between Neanderthals and modern humans outside of Africa, such that an estimate of approximately 2%, between 1% and 2% of the genomes of all non-Africans living today um, are derived from this mixture with Neanderthals. And so we have this rather, what I think is a rather by now simple model of how we think this integration happened. And we think that as modern humans um, arise in Africa and begin to expand out, they met Neanderthals and mixed with them quite early on, perhaps somewhere in the Middle East, somewhere in the Levant. This admixture has been dated to have happened between some, somewhere between 50 and 70,000 years ago. And this dating is based on the length of Neanderthal fragments present in modern human genomes. As these populations expand into Europe and Asia and even into Oceania, they carry then with them this Neanderthal ancestry, such that all populations have a roughly similar amount of Neanderthal ancestry, as I said, between one and 2%. In addition, when we looked at sharing with the Denisovan genome, we found an interesting pattern that it's people in um, present-day people in Oceania, particularly in Papua New Guinea and the Aboriginal people of Australia, carry Denisovan DNA at a rather high frequency. Between three and five percent of their genomes come from um, a, a mixture with the Denisovans. Present-day East Asians also carry a small amount of Denisovan ancestry that appears to come from a separate integration um, into, this, these East Asia, uh, into these East Asian populations. Integration, integrase DNA then, one can think of as sort of a bit of a dye. It traces the movement of early modern humans throughout the world, marking their encounters with archaic humans. And understanding when and where and how many times this admixture between um, archaic humans and modern humans has taken place is currently an incredibly active field of research. Over the last few years, it's become very clear that this is a very simple model and that this mixture is quite, this history of admixture is quite complex. I think what we do know is that this early introgression event um, from Neanderthal seems to contribute most of the Neanderthal DNA that we see in people today. And that if there is, or we know that there were other sort of local admixtures with Neanderthals, but that they don't contribute very much to people living today. These initial statistics that I told you about, they tell us how much Neanderthal DNA there is in the genomes of people, but they don't tell us very well um, how that Neanderthal DNA is distributed. And so to tackle this question of how archaic ancestry is distributed in the genomes of people living today, the groups of Josh Akey, who you see here on the left, and David Reich on the right, developed methods to take many thousands of human genome, modern human genomes and identify a Neanderthal and then later Denisovan introgressed sequences providing us then with maps of the precise locations of segments of archaic DNA in hundreds of modern human genomes. And what was immediately evident from those maps was that the Neanderthal DNA is not very where many people carry Neanderthal DNA. You can see sort of some of these regions down here, right, where there's, there's really a lot of, of Neanderthal DNA in both uh, 
in, in red Asians and in blue Europeans, a high frequency. There are also some regions, as you can sort of see here on chromosome 8 and here on chromosome 7, where there's almost no evidence for Neanderthal DNA in people living today. This signal suggests that the Neanderthal DNA that survives in modern humans has been subject to both negative selection, removing it from genomes, and positive selection since the mixture with Neanderthals. And looking a little bit more closely at this, we can see that regions where Neanderthal DNA is, is less common. So what we're looking at here are two, two plots for East Asians and West Eurasians. Um, they're both rather similar in their pattern. On the left, we see sequences, regions of the genome that are under tight evolutionary constraint that we think of as more important or more functional regions of the genome. And on the right, less constrained, um, perhaps less important functional regions of the genome. And on the y-axis, we see how much Neanderthal ancestry there is in each of these bins. And what you can clearly see is that in regions of the genome where there is more conservation, where we think there are more functional and functionally important sequences, there is less Neanderthal ancestry. And this observation has been used to propose that purifying selection has been important in removing Neanderthal alleles around genes and around other functional elements in the genomes of modern humans. This implies then that a substantial fraction of Neanderthal alleles were deleterious for modern humans. And there's been, there's been a lot of debate about why this might have been true. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about that, but I'm happy to ask, answer questions about it. One of the things that Martin Peter um, in my group has done, and you see Martin in the top right, together with Ben Verneau, who's a, a colleague here, um, is to look a little bit more closely at what the selection is exactly against. Um, it's, I think, was assumed that this would be selection against Neanderthal DNA in genes. But when Martin looked more closely at this and quantified the amount of Neanderthal ancestry, which you see here on the, on the left, um, in genomic regions with different kinds of functions, so using the functional annotation, he showed that contrary to the expectation, protein coding genes, which you see here in, in orange, Protein coding genes as a group are exactly at the genome wide average, so approximately 2% um, Neanderthal ancestry in protein coding genes. However, he also showed that if you look at the most conserved regions of protein coding genes, then there is some evidence for depletion of Neanderthal alleles. So it's not protein coding genes as a whole that have been where, where Neanderthal DNA has been selected against. What we do see is that. Um, the regions of the genome that do show depletion of Neanderthal DNA are promoter regions, indicating that the effect of selection of Neanderthal against Neanderthal DNA has been strongest in the regulatory regions of genes, and suggesting also that Neanderthals then might have differed more from modern humans in their regulatory architecture than in their protein coding sequences. So Despite this observation that I've just told you that there's quite extensive selection against Neanderthal DNA in the genomes of Europeans and Asians, we do find some regions where many individuals are and you're looking at the mean Neanderthal ancestry in Europeans in red and in East Asians in green. And what you can see is that it's quite uneven. You see that in, in Europeans here, 60% of individuals carry um, Neanderthal alleles in this region but rather a low proportion of East Asians do. You see here that both populations carry maybe 30% Neanderthal DNA. And um, here you see sort of more East Asian specific um, region. And so interestingly, some of these regions um, are probably consistent with positive selection on Neanderthal DNA in modern humans. So we're seeing sort of the other side of the coin that Neanderthal DNA can have been positively selected and maybe therefore have been advantageous. And so we started a project um, with my PhD student at the time, Misha Danaman, um, to try and identify archaic alleles that might've been advantageous for modern humans and to unravel the mechanisms by which they're acting. And to do, to do this, what we did is we scanned the genomes of 1,500 present day people from different populations from around the world and identified bits of introgressed Neanderthal DNA. So those pieces that match the Neanderthal Denisovan genomes, but differ from African genomes, where we know that there's no um, or little Neanderthal and Denisovan introgression. And we looked for those regions where Neanderthal or Denisovan DNA is at high frequency, so where many individuals carry it. And we looked at the lengths of the chunks of DNA um, that have been introduced using two maps the ones that I mentioned earlier from the from the um, Josh Aki group and from the David Wright group of uh, Neanderthal introgression. 
And among the regions that Misha identified with the highest Neanderthal ancestry was a genome, uh, genome the highest ancestry genome wide was a um, 143 kilobase long stretch on chromosome four. And the stretch encompasses three members of a gene family called the toll-like receptors. And Misha came to tell me about this. Um, Misha is a statistician and um, he came to and said, look, these genes all seem to be in the same family. What can we make of this? And so we started to look at these toll-like receptors and the human toll-like receptors are key proteins in the innate immune system. This is part of the immune system that's first, the first to respond to any pathogenic entry. And these three toll-like receptors that are in this cluster, they are all cell surface receptors. So they sit on the surface of, of cells and they recognize microbial surface proteins, microbial uh, lipopolysaccharides. And when they detect such a, a pathogen component, they then elicit an inflammatory response, an antimicrobial response, and then ad activate the adaptive immune response. And as such, these toll-like receptors are really critical genes acting in the very first line of defense against bacterial function. They've generally been thought of as being highly conserved. However, there was work done in the group of Luis Quintana Mossi at the Institute Pasteur that suggested that in modern humans, in some populations, there might have been positive selection in some of in, in, in the genes around this cluster. And so what we did to have a closer look at this is extract these 143 kilobase regions um, in a larger set of humans, about 2,500 individuals, and then clustered them by their sequence similarity. And this resulted in what we termed seven core haplotypes, and they're numbered here with Roman numerals. And these seven core haplotypes exist in present day people. The number on the right of each of these um, haplotypes is the number of chromosomes in which we observed the sequence and the colors correspond to where in the world we see it. So um, where red is Africa, yellow is the Americas, green is Asia and blue is Europe. And so what you can immediately see is that there's one very high frequency um, ha core haplotype that's haplotype five that's present everywhere in the world. We then aligned the sequences of these core haplotypes to um, the Neanderthal and Denisovan genome. And what was immediately striking was that there are three haplotypes that are closer to the archaic genomes than they are to any other modern human sequence. Two of them much more similar to the Neanderthal and one similar to the Denisovan. And what you see here is that there are two Neanderthal-like haplotypes, one of which is very common, this haplotype three, and it's present in all populations outside of Africa, but at highest frequency in Asia. And then we see another haplotype that's only present in Asia, also Neanderthal-like, as well as a rather rare Denisovan-like haplotype seen in two South Asian individuals, um, haplotype seven, which looks more like the Denisovan genome. And if we look at this on a map, what you can see is the non-archaic haplotypes in blue and the, the two Neanderthal-like haplotypes. The first one in orange, the common one, which you see is present in all populations, and the second Neanderthal haplotype, which is present just in Asia. We see that there's actually differences in frequency between these haplotypes in different populations, perhaps suggesting that there's been local population-specific selection, perhaps driven by different pathogens at different times um, in different populations. So we wanted to understand whether these introgressed haplotypes might have some functional effect. And we looked at the sequences of the associated archaic-like haplotypes. And the first ob observation was that none of the SNPs, none of the variants on the archaic haplotypes modifies any coding sequence of the toll-like receptor proteins. So these proteins look exactly like they do in modern, in modern humans, even the Neanderthal ones. However, what we did see was that there's an enrichment of archaic variants within known transcription factor binding motifs, suggesting that if there's an effect of the Neanderthal-like haplotypes around the toll-like receptors, it could be on the regulation of the expression of these toll-like receptors. And we were fortunate enough to have expression data, RNA-seq data from lymphoblastoid cell lines from the same individuals for which we had the genomes. And so we asked whether the individuals carrying these Neanderthal-like alleles differ in their expression of the toll-like receptor gene. So we asked if you have a Neanderthal toll-like receptor region, how is the toll-like receptor expressed compared to if you have a modern human toll-like receptor? And what we saw was that um, in lymphoblastoid cell lines, all three of the toll-like receptor genes show significantly higher expression in individuals carrying 
Neanderthal-like alleles. And what you see here is um, always homozygote for the Neanderthal-like allele on the left, in the middle, the heterozygotes, which are intermediate, and on the right, um, homozygote for the modern human alleles, and that's the lowest expression. And that's true for all of them. We have to note here that these are not independent. These genes are probably being regulated together, um, so not independent observations. We looked at a broader set of tissues to see whether this effect is tissue specific. And I'm not going to show you all the tissues we looked in. We looked in about 50. But as you can see from these two examples, lung and thyroid, there is no um, difference in expression in non-blood cell tissues. That there's a change in expression. But of course, it's interesting to find out whether these archaic haplotypes change the organism phenotype. And so to do that, we looked at genome-wide public genome-wide association study data. These are studies that link genetic variants to phenotypes in cohorts. And we found that there are 79 SNPs, um, GWAS-associated SNPs in this region, of which 13 are archaic-like. And we looked at the associations for those. These archaic-like SNPs showed significant associations in just two studies. And in both studies, they were the strongest candidates, the highest, um, the most significant um, hits. The first of these studies is um, a large study of common allergies carried out by 23andMe, looking for genetic associations between common allergies to things like dust and pollen and pet fur and grass. Um, and the second is a study that assessed um, the presence of antigens against Helicobacter pylori, a common infectious bacteria that causes gastritis and stomach ulcers. And in both cases, the archaic-like SNPs were the most strongly associated loci. And in both, in, in the first case, we see that the archaic-like alleles um, lead to an increased risk of allergy. And in the second case, we see that the archaic-like alleles lead to reduced Helicobacter pylori um, antigen presence. Um, so increased resistance to Helicobacter pylori. And we think, and we speculate here, we think what might be going on is that upregulation of the toll-like receptors um, increases the sensitivity of the innate immune system, um, therefore leading to increased allergic susceptibility. But that, um, and, and, and that the reason for this is that um, there is a, a, a response to a pathogen. So being more sensitive allows a better response to pathogens. And we're not talking that, we're not thinking that it's Helicobacter pylori here. We're saying that um, the increased expression of the in intraguest alleles might enhance innate immune surveillance against certain pathogens. Um, and that the price we pay for this is an increased allergic susceptibility in present day people. Most of the studies that have been done of, uh, on Neanderthal alleles have been sort of like, done like we've done this previous study, right? Where we sort of infer the function by looking at molecular databases and GWAS association studies, but a more direct way to understand the impact of, of um, introgression or admixture on modern humans is to look for direct associations between Neanderthal DNA and phenotypes of interest. However, it's only very recently that detailed information together with genotype data has started to become available. And the very first study to do this was a study on the eMERGE network with about 28,000 individuals. And um, they looked at 46 traits that they got from electronic health records. And they showed here that Neanderthal alleles explain a significant fraction of the risk for depression and also for certain skin lesions resulting from sun damage. At about the same time, the pilot release of a, a, set, a data set called the UK Biobank became available. And this is an amazing resource, uh, collecting and making available genotype data together with a really extensive set of phenotypes for around 500,000 British individuals. And using the pilot release, we were able for the first time to evaluate the contribution of Neanderthal alleles to a large number of phenotypes. And in this case, about 130, what they call baseline phenotypes and so non-disease phenotypes. And we did this by starting controlling for ancestry and relatedness, trimming the data set then down to around um, 115,000 participants where we could be sure that we don't have structure. And then from the 800,000 SNPs genotyped for each individual, we begin to, to identify intergressed Neanderthal variants that are present in each individual, um, identify sites where at least 100 individuals in the biobank match the Neanderthal genome and differ from Africans and then um, filter these so that they fall into long tracts of Neanderthal integration to make sure that we really have Neanderthal alleles. Uh, 
And then um, because the Neanderthal introgress DNA occurs in these haplotype blocks, we cluster the variants that are in linkage with one another and choose a tag SNP for each Neanderthal haplotype, each block of Neanderthal DNA. And then we carry out an association um, between, um, or we test for an association between the presence of Neanderthal alleles and each of these phenotypes. And when we do this, we identify um, a total of 15 associations of Neanderthal alleles with 11 distinct phenotypes, and these are all genome-wide significant. These include sleep and blood pressure, the proportion of muscle and fat, and other body size traits. But for me, most fascinatingly, about half of the associations here involve the integumentary system. So this is the skin or the hair, and particularly, it seems, pigmentation traits. Now, Pigmentation traits of the skin and hair is one of the most obvious differences between human groups. And pigmentation traits evolve probably quite quickly in response to differences in sunlight at different latitudes. So darker pigmentation is protective against UV damage, while lighter pigmentation facilitates the synthesis of vitamin D in high latitude environments with low levels of, of UV radiation. Pigmentation is also likely a target of sexual selection. And interestingly, we know very little about the skin and hair pigmentation of the Neanderthals. And it would be tempting to think that one might be able to look at the phenotype in people carrying Neanderthal alleles and learn something about the Neanderthal phenotype. However, I want to put this as a cautionary tale. We looked at one of the associations, and this, it, this association identifies for me very beautifully the difficulty with drawing simple conclusions about Neanderthal phenotypes from association studies. So among the strongest associations we found for Neanderthal alleles in the UK Biobank, were two distinct haplotypes um, in and near a gene called basal nucleon 2. And Neanderthal variants in basal nucleon 2 are among the Neanderthal introgressed alleles at the highest frequency in Europeans. They are, interestingly, almost absent in Asian populations. And there's also good evidence for recent positive selection on these variants in Europeans. And using the biobank, we can show directly that individuals carrying the Neanderthal alleles in this, where's my mouse, in the, the region on the right, in region A, um, those individuals tend to have fairer skin, and they also tend to have a higher risk for skin uh, damage or lesions caused by sun exposure. However, there's an, the other association just nearby, this association here, B, um, is also at quite an appreciable frequency, and carriers of the Neanderthal alleles here tend to have more olive-toned skin than individuals without integration in the region. And so, I don't think we can draw any simple conclusions about the Neanderthal phenotype from this introgression study. And what we did learn is that there are probably multiple alleles contributed by Neanderthals in and near this BNC2 gene that contribute to pigmentation variation in modern humans. Um, and perhaps they also suggest that Neanderthals themselves were variable in skin and hair pigmentation. So I've shown you some examples of how Neanderthal integrates DNA um, influences traits in present day humans. And there's a growing list of Neanderthal alleles that seem to have been adaptive, that have been good for modern humans. Interestingly, many of them involve defense against pathogens or phenotypic traits, which are clearly linked to the environment, such as skin and hair biology. And it's perhaps not surprising that some of those might have been adapted, adaptive for modern humans arriving in Eurasia. You can imagine that introgression provides the opportunity for modern humans moving into new environments to acquire alleles from the archaic humans who'd lived in these regions for hundreds of thousands of years and who were presumably quite well adapted to the local food and climate and particularly to the pathogens. In contrast, if they had to um, acquire new mutations to do so, this would have been much, a much slower process. Um, and so I like to think of this sort of integration or this mixing with the Neanderthals as providing us with a a new set of genetic variants that could then be um, used by modern humans to adapt to their, their new environment. So to sort of bring this to a close, I hope I've convinced you that sequencing archaic genomes provides us with a rich resource to begin to understand not just these archaic humans, but also modern human population history and, and adaptation. Um, we know that the patterns of Neanderthal ancestry tell us where admixture happened and, and also tell us about how human diversity was shaped by mixing with archaic humans. Um, identifying integrated Neanderthal DNA that's been under selection points us at, at selective pressures, at, at fa uh, factors in the environment that have been important in recent modern human evolution. And then linking integrated archaic DNA 
to phenotypic traits allows us to start to unravel the genetic architecture of these traits. So we start to learn about which genes are important for which traits. And perhaps at some point it can tell us something about the phenotypic differences between Neanderthals and modern humans. Um, I think that's an area where there's still lots of work to be done. And so finally, I just want to acknowledge all the archaeologists and the volunteers that share with us their interesting specimens and who make this work possible, as well as the team of um, scientists at the Max Planck Institute, led by Svante Pebo, and particularly my colleague Matthias Meyer, who's generated much of this data. And then all the people who've participated in the analysis, both at, both at the Max Planck Institute, and I've pointed out people as I go, but also our outside collaborators. And finally, thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Janet, for your talk. So if you uh, if you have any questions, please put the questions in the in the in the chat. There is one question. Okay. Uh, okay. The first question is. Uh, is if you think uh, it will be possible to do genome-wide association studies using only Neanderthal or Denisovan genomes? genomes. I suspect it will not be, simply because most traits, um, the, the genetic basis of most, the frequency, the number of individuals that you need in order to do a, gen a genome-wide association study is very high. And, um, we, and you need the phenotypes, right? So we have only very few phenotypes we can get from Neanderthals and Denisovans, largely skeletal phenotypes, things like skull morphology. But then to do the association study directly in Neanderthals and Denisovans, we would need many, many individuals and many genomes. Um, as, we, as we've seen from modern human studies, typically many thousand. Um, and I just don't think that we will get there. <laughs> okay, the second question is, uh, are there any specific environmental conditions that better maintain ancient? There are. We know that um, DNA that's uh, from the permafrost, so that's kept in very nice cold conditions like you would keep in a freezer. We know that, that those samples tend to work very well. Um, it's not that there's a perfect correlation between, say, temperature and DNA preservation, but it is, uh, is true that the colder and more stable the climate the better DNA tends to preserve. There are also other factors like um, uh, pH of the soil, which we see as associated, and then also the kind of bone or tooth. Um, there are a number of reports reporting that certain skeletal elements preserve DNA better than others. Um, this is anecdotal. There are some examples. It's not always true, however. Uh, okay, uh, the third question is from Gonzalo. Uh, uh, she's, uh, he says that um, regulatory and interactome networks in humans, maybe also in eukaryotes in general, are really complex. Hence, integrations can easily perturb a fine equilibrium in them. Have you checked if positive and negative variants from Neanderthals belong to different types of connected genes in that network? I, I mean, you can only modify by integrations, perhaps models that are somehow a bit independent. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, there has been some work done on this, not by us, but by um, Laurent Scoffier's group, um, looking at regulatory mod modules. And um, I, th I think it's interesting that, that, that this is the set of genes that have been the most strongly selected, the set of changes that have been the most strongly selected against. It might indicate, indeed, that these regulatory ne networks need to be quite stable in order to function. Okay, and I think that the last question is from Aldair, and he said that if you think it will be possible to do genome, uh, uh, oh no, that was that was the the the, the, the other question. Um, no, I think that there are no more questions. There is one from Glady mm -hmm. down in the chat. Uh, oh, she yeah. Said, uh, okay. <laughs> so, okay, I think, yeah. so it's possible to relate viral infections with our studies too. So uh, yes, there's actually some interesting work that's been done recently looking at um, particularly the um, 
SARS-CoV-2. And uh, there is a, the strongest association, and I'm going to just try and sort of remember this, but the strongest association for severe SARS-CoV-2, so for being um, in intensive care and needing, um, needing extensive treatment, um, is a locus on chromosome 3. And interestingly, it seems very clear that that locus on chromosome 3, which is a, risk, a set of risk alleles, introduced by Neanderthal integration. So indeed, it seems that um, we can look at susceptibility to viral infection. The, interestingly, that um, introgressed locus does not seem to change whether or not you get infected with SARS-CoV-2. It only changes the uh, severity of the, of the course of the infection. So there's an example of a Neanderthal introgressed haplotype which is present um, at relatively low frequency in Europe and um, higher frequency in South Asia, which seems to um, make us more susceptible to severe disease. Um, so it will be interesting. I think that because pathogens are such a strong selective force that, and, and because we think that Neanderthals were adapted to local pathogens um, in, in Eurasia for a rather extended time, we might find that there are many effects of, of Neanderthal alleles, that there might be some, in, there is some enrichment, in fact, for um, phenotypic effects um, on immune response, both to viruses and to, and to bacteria. And this work showing that, in fact, um, viral response seems to be more effective even than bacterial response.